a couple of things about Stephen's home in Elise. Some of you have given to serve the world before, and you might have noticed seen that beautiful home that they showed there. We help to build that through your generosity. When you give to serve the world, you give to things like that. And the last little piece left is the vans that they need, the fully equipped vans for transporting these men. And that's kind of helping get this whole project across the finish line. Our goal is $60,000 to buy and equip those vans. Last year, we, we, you might remember if you were here, we talked about um, the ministry called Hope for Life and Amanda Good and Rwanda. And there was a goal of $70,000 and you gave over $200,000. And just so you know, all that money not only allowed us to bless Amanda and Hope for Life, but to bless our other Serve the World partners like Stephen's House and, and, and Elise West. And so I just want to encourage you throughout the rest of this month, is you, if you give to that, it's going to go to meet that need. And once we exceed that, which I have every confidence that we will, it'll bless our other Serve the World partners as well. And it's such an exciting thing. You know, Elise is somebody, no one's going to, who, who cares about special needs adult men from Ukraine? God does. And he calls people like Elise to love them. It's, she's a hero. She's a hero, and it's fun to get to introduce you to heroes like that of our faith. And so I encourage you to be generous toward that and see what God does. And we can't wait to tell you the story uh, as it unfolds and what God's doing there. Let's bow now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we thank you for heroes like Elise. And we thank you that you're a God who's even now, today, is still calling and sending people locally and globally for your purposes. We ask you to speak to us because we need to hear what you have to say. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the question everyone asks this time of year, are you ready for? Yes. You say it like you're, like you're depressed to hear that. Uh, right? Are you ready for Christmas? Are you? Kids last hour like, yes, we're totally ready. That's because you do nothing, kids, but sit and wait for presents. Moms and dads, are you ready for Christmas? Eh. Like, what does ready mean? Like all the stuff you have to buy and cook and prepare and wrap and send, like all the stuff you have to do. I don't know about you, but I never quite feel ready. For the, like we were driving home last night. My wife and I look at everybody else's lights are up and feeling more and more stressed. Look what they have up and they have up and that looks gaudy. And I, we didn't do that yet. And we got to get our, you know, the bins are still in the basement. I got to find them. You know, we got to get things up and ready. Why? Because everybody else is doing that. Like Hallmark movies have been out since July. <laughs> Starbucks cups have been out since August. By the way, I saw on Facebook, uh, it was called a, a men's survival guide to Hallmark Christmas movies. Tip number one, it's all the same movie, just so you're wondering, in case you're wondering. Anyway, there's just a lot going on, and it feels like it's a big, giant challenge to get ready. But more importantly, are you ready spiritually? We're in the second week of our series for Advent, Light of the World. Are you prepared spiritually? Is your home prepared? Is your heart prepared? Are you ready? Sometimes if we're not careful, it just flies by. We're just trying to get all the stuff done and get through it. And that's a shame. It's a tragedy, really. And we're going to look this morning at the story of somebody in the story of Jesus that is often overlooked at Christmas time, but he's a central figure to the story. And his whole life and his whole purpose was to get ready, to help other people, God's people, all people, prepare and get ready. So in order to help us get ready and prepare, I want to give you a moment of quiet. Maybe you don't have that. I don't know all of you very well. Maybe you came here for the first time. Maybe you came and you're scrambling to get out of here to get some shopping done. Maybe you're feeling the stress. Maybe you're feeling isolated and lonely. Maybe you don't know what you're feeling. But we're all here right now together. So I'm going to give you a moment of quiet. And then I'm going to read to you our text for this whole series. So let's just be quiet and prepare our hearts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. 
He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Familiar passage, I'm guessing, to most of you. Last week, Pastor Brian talked to us about what it means that Jesus is the word, the logos, and the light that shines in the darkness. John's gospel is unique among the the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's unique in that John wrote predominantly to a non-Jewish audience. He wrote to a group of people who did not, were not steeped in the Jewish scriptures and traditions. They were Greek-speaking Gentiles predominantly. And he's speaking to them about the the divine wisdom of God, the the central, ultimate reality of the universe, the logos, that's the word translated word, is Jesus, this light that shines in the darkness. John, uh, the author of John, in, in chapter 20, verse 31, gives us the purpose for the whole gospel, like why he wrote it. And really the purpose statement for the whole Bible He says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you would have life in his name. You want to know what the Bible's for? That's what it's for. That's why John wrote. So that you would know who Jesus is, the Son of God, and that in knowing you would believe, and by believing, you'd have life in his name. Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10, talking about himself as the good shepherd, said that the thief comes to rob, still kill, and steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life, full life, comes through belief in Jesus. That's what the whole thing's about. In John chapter 5, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is why John's gospel sometimes is called the gospel of belief. It's all about who Jesus is and what that means, why that matters. And we see it right here in the prologue. Verses 1 through 14 of John 1 is the prologue to John's gospel. Sort of the, the introductory setting the stage. But did you notice as I read it, The stuff about this other guy named John sounds like a change of the subject, doesn't it? I mean, verses one through four, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In verse nine, uh, we read, the true light which gives light to all mankind was coming into the world. And then verses six through eight, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Does it sound like it's like this weird non sequitur, like what's John writing about John? And by the way, is it the same John? If you're new to reading the Bible or studying this, don't be confused. The guy who wrote John is named John. That's why it's called John. And he's writing about John, but that's not the same John. You with me, John? John the Baptist is referring to here. So John the Evangelist wrote his gospel, and he's referring to a man named John the Baptist. Not the same John. Two different guys, in case you're wondering. And he says, in the middle of this This, like, soaring theology about Jesus. He says, oh, by the way, there's this guy named John who was sent by God. Like, what? Why is that in there? Why say it that way? It's so important, but easily overlooked for us. It's easy to miss this. Let me read verses 6 through 8 for you again. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Sounds pretty straightforward. The word witness is mentioned three times in there, in John's name. You could boil this down into three simple statements, which will be our outline to try to make sense of this in our own lives. Number one, God sent a man named John. Number two, John came as a witness to the light. Number three, the point of his witness was that all might believe. Okay, first, God sent a messenger named John. Again, by the way, John, anybody know what John the Baptist's relationship was to Jesus? Cousin. If you didn't know that, now Bible trivia, you got one, right? Jesus' cousin. In fact, if you read in Luke chapter 1, there's a very long chapter. It tells the, the foretelling of Jesus' birth and of John the Baptist's birth. John's parents were an old couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest, and the angel Gabriel shows up to him in the temple and says, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah, shame on him, doesn't believe it, and so God closes his mouth until the baby's born. He has to write stuff down until the baby's born because he didn't believe what Gabriel said. And Gabriel has this remarkable prophecy. He says, he will be great before the Lord. He will turn many hearts of Israel's children back to the Lord their God. He will go on in the spirit and power of Elijah 
and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Those words, make ready and a people prepared, will be the themes of John's whole life. His whole life is to get people ready, to prepare people for Jesus. In fact, there's a fascinating story in Luke chapter 1. When Mary, who's pregnant, visits Elizabeth, who's pregnant, with John the Baptist. And when Mary and the baby in her womb, Jesus, comes into proximity to Elizabeth and the baby in her womb, John the Baptist, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. I don't know what you make of that, but the Bible seems to indicate that in the womb, he knew his purpose. He knew that his whole purpose was to point people to Jesus. John's living with this deep sense of who he is. And I'm going to read to you from uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 80. It won't be on your screens. I just want to read this passage to you because it's so, uh, it's really, really important for us to hear. This is Zechariah, John's dad, speaking a word of prophecy over his son, about his son. And he's paraphrasing and quoting from Isaiah 9, the passage we always read at Christmas time. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we, God's people, should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us, to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, speaking about his son now, John the Baptist, and you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, where the sun shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide their feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. John has that hanging over his life. He's living as a young boy under that. That's who he is. That's what he's about. I wonder, do your kids, you moms and dads, grandparents, do they know what they're about? Do they know what their purpose is? Do they know why they're here? Do you know? When my, when we, before we had children, you know, I thought about things like as a dad. I always think about this when it's Dedication Sunday. I thought, like, I want to teach my son to tackle and throw a ball and run fast and my daughter, you know, whatever, all the things that I could teach him. A good double leg takedown, you know, the kind of things they need to know in life. <laughs> but then when my children were born, what I wanted was the stuff I can't, I can't actually give them. Only God can give. What I really, really wanted was them to know Jesus and how much he loves them and to know that that's the reason for their life. So, moms and dads, you're not raising John the Baptist. There's only one of him. But you are absolutely speaking words of identity and purpose into your children's life. Is it the right thing? It hasn't always been for me sometimes. You're giving them a sense of who they are. When our kids were little, we'd ask them these questions. Who loves you more than the whole wide world? And we taught them the answers ahead of time. You and mommy, right? And who loves you even more than that? God. And what's the most important thing in your whole life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. You, that's right, now go to bed. <laughs> a little nighttime ritual, you know? But what was behind that? Imperfect as we were as parents, a desire for them to know mom and dad love you, but that pales in comparison to God's love for you. That's what defines you. And the most important thing in your life is to love and serve him. That's who you are. We've got a lot of kids growing up with no sense of who they are. It's our jobs, not just as biological parents, but as spiritual parents and crazy uncles and weird aunts, to help generations know who they are. John's growing up, and he knows who he is. He knows what his life is about. He knows what his purpose is. These are the themes of his life. His father has spoken them over him. He's heard them all his life. We don't talk about John very much, but he's, he's the bridge between the Old and the New Testament. In fact, listen to what Jesus says about John in Matthew chapter 11. This is, this is astounding. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, that's pretty much everybody, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. What? Among those born of women, 
No one is greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. There's some cryptic language there. We'll get to this stuff in a minute. But he's saying basically, John's greatness is in, in, is in what? He's the last in the line of the prophets. All the prophets are pointing to coming up to John, and John's the last. Why is John the last? Because who comes after John? You can't get this one wrong. You're in church. Just say Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus. It's always all been about Jesus. All the law and the prophets are pointing to him. John's the last in that line. He bridges the old and new covenants. And his greatness is in that. His greatness is not in himself. Jesus says he's the greatest among those born of women. What is it? Not because of he's the greatest preacher or the smartest or the wisest or the most faithful. It's because of his message, the one who called and sent him. The one to whom he was born to point. Jesus. This simple phrase, there was a man sent by God. There's no title or responsibility or role you could ever have from any human authority in the world, ever, that could compare to those words. A woman or a man sent by God. But if we're honest, throughout human history, there's a lot of people who have said they're sent by God that are nut jobs. Can we be honest about that? Cult leaders, false prophets and false teachers, total wackadoodles, dangerous people who say, God sent me. How do you know? How do you know? One way is you look clearly at what John's purpose was. How do you know he's sent by God? Because his life was never about himself. It was always from the womb to point to Jesus. If ultimate reality, truth, exists only as an abstract thing in the universe, then we're... We can't know. If truth is just out there and it's beyond us, then we are really groping around in the dark with our finite minds. The best we could do is make educated guesses on our limited knowledge of science and, and, and philosophy. and We really can't know. Not for sure, because we're limited if truth is just abstract concepts that exist out there in the cold, dark universe. But the whole point of John's gospel is truth is not an abstraction. Truth is not an abstract reality, but a personal one. It's a person. Ultimate reality, truth, logos, has made himself known in the person of Jesus. God has turned the lights on, as it were, in the human heart, in, in the world, in Jesus. And not only that, he sent messengers to reveal himself. If truth is not abstract but personal, then the personal God could, if he chose, make himself known by coming into the world, which he has done, and by choosing people to be witnesses to who he is. That's the message of John. He has chosen then and now to send messengers. This is the second point. John came to be a witness to the light. What's a witness? What is a witness? I so badly when I was preparing wanted to say, can I get a witness? <laughs> I just did say that. <laughs> Well, what is a witness? Somebody who has seen something, who knows something by experience, who has a story to tell from their personal experience. I've got something to say. I've seen, I've heard, I know. God's made himself known to me and through me. Now, the eternal light of Christ does not need me or you or John the Baptist, for that matter, to make him shine brighter. That's like saying a candle adds something to a lightning strike in the, in the dark. It doesn't he doesn't need us. We, I add nothing to him. But God in his wisdom has chosen not to make himself known by lightning strike or sky riding, but by individual lights in human hearts. By the light of eternal life lighting up in your life and in your life and in your life and in mine. That's how he's chosen to light up the world. Through witnesses. God sent and God still sends witnesses. Listen to how jo uh, Jesus describes the witness of John the Baptist in John chapter 5, verses 32 through 40. He says, There is another who bears witness about me, 
And I know that the testimony that he bears is about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I received is from man, but I say these things to you that you may be saved. He, John the Baptist, was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me, the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard, his form you've never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it's they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus says a lot of things profound here. He says about John the Baptist, he was a burning and shining lamp. Uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote a sermon about those two words, burning and shining. Fascinating sermon. He says, take those two words together. The word burning refers to inner passion. And the word shining refers to outward witness, outward example. Both have to be true to be a faithful witness. John's life, you might know the story of John. John, after he was born and grew up, he, he left his family, and we're told in Luke chapter 1, he went into the wilderness, right, where he stayed until his public appearance. He lived in the wilderness, in the Judean wilderness, eating locusts and honey, wild honey, and wearing camel's hair clothing. John was a wild dude. John was a, a kind of, people of his day thought he was a crazy person, a zealot, like a, a, a little bit extreme. John lived a life that would make most of us feel very uncomfortable. And his inner life, his burning, was fueled by all this time in solitude and prayer. There was substance, in other words. It wasn't just words. There was a deep, inner, burning passion for Jesus. And that came through externally. And those have to go together. Most of us would agree. Would you agree with this statement? John was a great man of God. Yeah? John was a man of courage. Yes? John was a man of conviction. Yes? John was a man of boldness. Yes. John was a little weird. John was a guy I would love to have at my neighborhood Christmas party. <laughs> How many of you would say, I'd like to have John over with all my friends and neighbors when I have a Christmas party? Probably not. It, it would be, John would upset things. Like you'd have all your friends there and he'd be walking around in his camel's hair suit like, John, really? It's December out, you know? Eating locusts. He won't eat the Christmas cookies. He's eating locusts only. He's walking around with his wild hair talking about Jesus all the time. Jesus, 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 Jesus. After a while, I'd be like, you're making people feel uncomfortable, John. I mean, these are my guests. Could you just tone the Jesus thing down a little bit? I mean, I know he's the reason for the season, but take it easy. We like our faith heroes at a distance, don't we? Over there, I can admire them over there. They're, more, they're less dangerous over there. They're less likely to disrupt my life over there. They're less, less likely to, to mess up the status quo. But that's not, I remember, I've told this story before, but I, years ago when my son was in Little League, a guy that was the dad helping coach, he, he, he asked what I did for a living. I said, I'm a pastor. And he went, huh, not what I expected. <laughs> and I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> and then he said, I, could, I should come to your church. I could use a little Jesus in my life. Well, he wants to be in your life, but he's not little. There's no such thing as a little Jesus in your life. If I asked you if you believe in Jesus, I don't know all of you. I'm going to guess most of you, not all, but most of you would say yes. But there's a difference between believing in Jesus and having Jesus as the sole focus and purpose of your life. If I'm honest, and I bet if you're honest, most of you would say most of the time, yes, I believe in Jesus. But my purpose, my focus is my career, my family, myself. I mean, I believe. Yes, I believe. But this is what I'm about. With John, those things were perfectly integrated. And John's not to be an exception for the Christian life. We think of it that way, right? He's distant from us. He's like a crazy person in the ancient story. He's an example to us. And probably the best thing about G John's life purpose statement is in verse 8. It says simply, he was not the light. He was not the light. We have this deep human need to make some other human being the light. A pastor, a preacher, 
a, a self-help guru, the best-selling author, Facebook followers, somebody, a fitness expert, somebody on TV, somebody, we're, we're always looking to somebody. They have the secret. They have the thing. They've got the secret sauce. Follow that person. Listen to this. Try this. They're the light. Newsflash, I need to tell you something. I'm not the light. Most of you are like, yeah, we, we already know that. You're not the light. <laughs> you know. I'm not the light. Churches get themselves so wrong. We see it all the time when we start thinking that that person is the light. You're not the light. I'm not the light. Pastor Brian, Anton, none of us are the light. There's only one light. There's only one light. And it's Jesus. I always point over here because that's where the cross is. I don't, it's not that Jesus is only in this corner of the room. That's where he is, right? It's Jesus. If you leave with nothing else this morning, I hope you'll walk out of here knowing there's only one light of the world. And we live in a culture where people are looking all the wrong places for the light. They're groping in the darkness for lesser lights that will not guide them. John says in verse one, chapter 1, verse 27, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. The, the, the Pharisees come and say, are you the Christ? He says, I'm not the Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 30, he says, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. This is a fascinating story. Here's how it goes. John the Baptist is the Jordan River baptizing, and he's become kind of a big deal. He's got disciples. He's got a following. His ratings are going up. People are flocking out from Jerusalem to the wilderness to hear this, this, this guy preach because he's compelling. He's a zealot. I mean, he's, his words are powerful. Even the Pharisees are coming to hear him, and people will be baptized by him. And then Jesus shows up, and John says, behold, he's the one, the Lamb of God. He's the light. And people start leaving John and going to Jesus. And John's followers come to John and say, John, dude, we've got a problem. Like, your ratings are plummeting. This is bad for business. We thought you were the thing. And now everyone's going to him. And John says, you misunderstand. I've never been the thing. He's always been the thing. It's always, always, always been about him. My whole life has been about him. He must increase and I must decrease. If you're looking for a purpose for your life, you could do a lot worse than that. I want my life to increase Jesus and decrease me. We like to think of Jesus as the cute baby in the manger this season, right? He's safe there. Baby Jesus, sweet baby Jesus. You know what? Wouldn't you ever want Jesus smelled like in a manger? Not good. Last hour, one of the babies up here. Not good. I won't tell you which one. <laughs> John's message was for people to repent of their sin, humble themselves, get on their faces and confess their sin before God to prepare themselves for the one who is coming into the world to bring salvation through his death on a cross and an ultimate judgment into the world. That's the baby. It's God in the manger. The Lord of heaven and earth in there. And John's whole life was to prepare people not for acute sentimentality, but to wake up, to have the light of Christ shine to their hearts. John lived a life that would make most of us a little anxious. What's the singular purpose of your life? What are you here for? That simple phrase, he was not the light. I am not, you are not the light. There is only one light, and I'm here to point to him. Paul said in St. Corinthians chapter 4 that we preach this message, not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Finally, the purpose of John's witness was that all might believe. God sent a messenger. He still sends messengers. And the messenger was a witness to the light. There's only one light. And the purpose was that all might believe. This is the purpose of the entire Bible, that you might believe. The Bible, friends, is not a collection of uh, wise moral sayings and inspirational stories, though most people think of it that way. It's not good advice, fundamentally. I mean, there's good advice in it, but it's not fundamentally good advice. You don't need another book of advice you don't need more philosophies to ascribe to. It's not even a set of propositions that you have to intellectually believe in. Fundamentally, you know what the Bible is? It's a witness. It's a testimony. It's a witness to the light. 
to the one who is, who was and is and is to come. And God, I think, if God could speak to us this morning, he would say something like, if I could show you on these screens, if I could just flash up here a fraction of what I'm doing in the world, you would not believe it. It would overwhelm you. People like Elise West is the tip of the iceberg. I'm at work in so many ways. I didn't just do something 2,000 years ago when I sent one messenger. I'm doing things right now. I'm sending messengers right now. Maybe right now he's sending a message to you through me. I don't know that I have the words. That humbles me, but maybe he is sending a message to you right now that all might believe. Maybe that's you. You're here, and you don't believe. I mean, intellectually, you'd think there's a God, but you, you don't believe in Jesus Christ as the light, not just of the world in general, but of your life, your hope, your purpose, your personal Savior. This is the reason. Or maybe you believe, but you're like a lot of us. You keep belief in its place. I believe, but this is what I'm about. And God is saying, stop separating that. That's not the life I called you to live. I am your purpose. I am your life. We just studied Colossians. Remember what Paul says? When Christ, who is your life, appears. It's your life. The light of life. We may not all be John the Baptist, but we are all called and sent by God to be a witness to the light. There's only one John the Baptist, but by definition, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you trust in him for forgiveness, then you are, the Bible says, a sent and called person. You are sent as a witness to the light. God's way of shining his light in the world is through human witnesses. It has always been so. Romans chapter 10, how will they believe if they've not heard? And how will they hear if someone doesn't preach? And how will they preach if they are not sent? That's not referring to just a few professionals. That's you, and that's me. That's all of us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the purpose statement of the church, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus says, it says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Speaking to his disciples, his followers, to us. And Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, writing to the church, writing to us, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that what? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I said this last week at the South Street campus, but it bears repeating. You've heard the statement, sometimes attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel in everything you do, and if necessary, use words. Have you heard this? We don't actually know if St. Francis ever said that. And by the way, that's ridiculous. It's nonsense. Oh, yes. Think about it. Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. You cannot preach the gospel without words. Words are required. Yes, your life should reflect Jesus. Yes, you, the love and grace and truth that you live with should be a shining light. But you cannot preach the gospel without words. We were given words, right? We need to speak true and beautiful and right things about who Jesus is. Not just with our actions, with our mouths as well. There's a limit to what you can say non-verbally, isn't there? I can let you know non-verbally that I like you. Right? I can let you know non-verbally I don't like you. Right? But what if I said, meet me in the parking lot at 1245? How can I do that without words? Well, maybe sign language, I don't know. Right? What if I said, meet me at 1245 in the parking lot and follow me to Egg Harbor? And bring your checkbook. <laughs> bring your credit card, right? How do I say that without words? Like how, do we, how would you say it? Certain things require words. Here's my point. It's not enough for you to live a nice life and just be a good person and hope people figure it out. It's not why you're here. I'm not here just to be good. Don't make waves. Be nice. You're here to be a witness to the light. By your actions, by your life, yes, of course. And as God gives us opportunity to tell people about the love and mercy and goodness and grace of Jesus. He's worth talking about. We talk about everything else in this culture. 
He's worth sharing. He's worth witnessing to. And you think, well, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a preacher. I don't know that. You don't have to. You can talk about what he's done for you. You can talk about who he is in your life. Every one of us. God is still saving and God is still sending people into this world. Some of you, you need to hear the message of belief. You don't believe and God is saying right now, now is your moment. The witness, the light, it's shining now. Some of you have separated belief and life and God's saying, let's bring those things together. That's what I've called you to do. He is the light of the world. There's only one light. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this story, the ancient story about John the Baptist who seems so distant from us and so strange to us. But it should not be so. Because in a very real sense, just as you called and sent John the Baptist, you have called and sent us. When Jesus says, greater are those least in the kingdom than John, you're talking about us, Lord. Because we now see with clear eyes the cross and the empty tomb, not just the manger. We thank you for the light of your truth. For those who are here this morning who do not believe, but you're drawing them into belief and wanting to desperately to give them life in your name, God, may you give them the faith to respond. And for those of us, like so many in our suburban culture, who want to separate belief from life, God, forgive us for that. And help us to integrate our whole lives to be lived in light of your glory. We pray it in your name. Lord Jesus, amen.